marvellous. And I'm joining from Barcelona, where it's also sunny, which is nice, because um, it wasn't yesterday, it was raining. <laughs> but uh, it's lovely today. We've got Macedonia, Greece. There's always a competition to see how, how quickly you can sort of say all of the, uh, the countries, but it just gets to the point where it's... Sydney, Australia. Impossible. Awesome. <laughs> Vietnam. <laughs> I love this bit. I can, I know. <laughs> That's good. Okay, I'm just going to share my screen and just run through a few things. I'll, I'll talk for a very short time and then I'll hand over to, to Joe. So hopefully you can see my screen there. So welcome everyone. Um, I would say happy World Teachers Day. It's, World Teachers Day obviously was, or International World Teachers Day, should I say, was yesterday. Um, but we've decided that it's going to continue for another three days or four days. So there we go. So it's World Teachers Day all week. Um, according to us. So there you go. So you can celebrate it again today. <clears throat> um, so yes, as I say, welcome everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us. I'm just going to run through a couple of things. So chat and Q&A. Joe has already done part of my job for me by telling you to um, type, to make sure you type to everyone and not to the hosts and panellists. So that means that everyone can see your messages, which is brilliant. Um, Obviously, chat and Q&A. Chat is for chat to say hello and comment, um, and Q&A is for questions. So any questions that you have for Joe um, about his talk, um, please use the Q&A box um, for that, and, um, and we'll try and answer as many of those questions as we can in the 15 minutes at the end. Um, certificates, no doubt I will be repeating this, but um, I'll say it anyway. Certificates, uh, there are different ways that you can get it. Um, it's a PDF certificate, it's editable, um, so you download it, save it um, to your computer and then open it up and type in your name where it says type your name here and then save it again and, um, and then you've got your certificate. You'll get that link to the certificate in the thank you email that you will receive 24 hours after this webinar finishes. Um, so please be patient and wait for that to come. Alternatively, um, there's a feedback survey which should open up on your screen when this webinar ends. Um, if you complete the survey, uh, then at the end, the prize is the link to the certificate. So, um, there we go. I will also put a link into the chat um, towards the end of the webinar, um, a link to the certificate, although I appreciate that if you're watching on a mobile phone, um, you probably won't be able to click those links because they're not clickable on mobiles. Um, we will be recording the webinar and that will be available, I say 24 hours after the live event, it'll probably be available later today. So um, if you know of anyone or you have any colleagues who haven't been able to, um, to watch or you need to leave early, um, then you can catch the recording a little bit later today or tomorrow. Um, and I think that's pretty much all from me so i'm going to stop sharing i'm going to introduce joe quickly and then i'm going to disappear and switch my microphone off because you've come to see him and not me anyway um so uh joe joe dale is an independent languages consultant from the uk um he works with a range of organizations i won't say them all but there's lots of them um he was host of the tes mfl forum for six years. Uh, he's a, um, a regular conference speaker. Uh, he's an expert, recognized expert, in fact, on technology and language learning. Um, he was a, an English language teacher previously. Um, he's spoken at conferences all over the world, both face to face and online. Um, he supported the Erasmus Plus project, um, Conflict to Cooperation, with five European countries. And he's also currently at the moment supporting the Erasmus Plus project learning um, to think and live outside the box. Um, he's done lots of things. He's um, a bit of a guru and a bit of a tech wizard. Um, so I'm going to stop talking and hand over to you, Joe. Lovely. Thanks ever so much, Paul. Um, I'm really, really delighted to be here. It's, uh, it's a real honour to be taking part in World, in World Teachers Day. Um, so thank you ever so much to the British Council uh, for this opportunity and for uh, Paul for hosting uh, the session as well. Uh, if I give you a little bit of background about myself, if that's OK. Um, uh, so uh, as, uh, as Paul said, I'm a former languages teacher. I taught uh, French uh, for 13 years at secondary school level for three years and then 10 years at middle school level, uh, nine to 13 year olds um, on the Isle of Wight, which is where I still live. And I've lived here for over 20 years. 
Uh, I've also done lots of things um, for uh, English teachers as well. I've, I've uh, spoken at the IATFL conference many, many times since uh, 2013. Uh, I also, uh, when I was a bit younger, I, I worked um, on uh, young learners courses for pilgrims as well, based in Canterbury. Um, and I did that for eight years as well. And I've done lots and lots of work with the British Council. And particularly during the pandemic, I've been doing many, many webinars uh, to support uh, teachers around remote learning, hybrid learning, and um, everything in between. So I've got my two screens uh, running. So on my second screen, I've got the chat running and I've got the questions uh, box, Q&A box running as well. So if you want to ask me any questions, feel free to do so. And I will um, uh, we'll have some time at the end, about 10, 15 minutes at the end to go through some questions. But if you want to pop a question in the chat or in the Q&A, feel free to do so. Uh, and I will um, uh, either deal with it there and then or um, at the end. My Twitter account is on the screen. It's at Joe Dale. I've got over 32,000 followers now, uh, which is a little bit crazy, but I have been on Twitter for over 14 years. So if you have any questions you'd like me to maybe retweet for you, or you'd like to contact me via direct message or what have you, feel free to, to do so. And my email address is joedale.talk21.com. I will be sharing the whole presentation with you, which is a Google Slides presentation on the last slide. And as you know, we are recording live as well. So um, today's session is around quizzing tools, retrieval practice, and multimodal feedback in language lessons. And I really hope that you find it useful. So in this session, as you can see, uh, I'm a fan of Bitmojis. Um, the Our Voices Have Power um, text there uh, just comes with that particular Bitmoji, but how appropriate uh, in the present time to have that, I think. So as you can see in this session, we're gonna be looking at a range of different cross-platform tools. Um, which promotes collaboration, independent learning, retrieval practice and assessment opportunities. But first and foremost, we're going to focus on the pedagogy and not about uh, the technology. So to start off with, um, I'm going to play you a little video clip from Tom Sherrington, who is a, a consultant in the UK and is known as Teacher Head on Twitter. And he's going to give a, a, a brief introduction about what retrieval practice is. And I will just quickly uh, make sure that I have shared computer sound which i have so you should be able to hear this fine so here we are this is tom talking about what retrieval practice is hello this is the second video in the series about evidence-informed ideas that all teachers should know and in this one we're going to talk about the importance of strengthening long-term memory through retrieval practice this is very well evidenced through lots of cognitive science that we strengthen our memory not so much by continually re-engaging with the information and trying to get it in over and over, but actually by practicing remembering, by trying to practice putting the memories we've already got from our long-term memory back into our working memory. And by doing that repeatedly, we actually are better at remembering things in the long term and we're less likely to forget. Exactly. So that's a really important point. What I'm going to be showing you today is based um, on, on research, in this case around retrieval practice. And what Tom was saying there was the, the, that sort of push and pull that you have between the long term memory to the, the working memory and how we need to think about different ways in which we can uh, use uh, different tools in this, in this example to uh, make that process uh, better and stronger in order to help uh, uh, learners remember. Hello. This is the remember the the content that we're, we're studying now um as i mentioned uh, my background is uh, modern foreign languages I, as i said i was a, a french teacher for 13 years and i'm connected very much with lots of people um on social media particularly on twitter the organization or the the, the community should i say known as the mfl twitterati so that's mfl t-w-i-t-t-e-r-a-t-i -T -T -E the mfl twitterati and the MFL Twitterati has been around uh, officially since about 2008. There's 5,000 members of the, uh, the MFL Twitterers list, which is a list which I manage on my uh, Twitter account, at Joe Dale. Um, but the hashtag is used by people literally all over the world, and it has been for many years. And you would find it a really rich resource if you were to um, check it out for, say, 10 minutes a day while you're having a cup of coffee or what have you. Um, just uh, finding uh, what people are tweeting about. And in particular, if you put in, say, a keyword like MFL Twitter RT plus um, retrieval practice or MFL Twitter RT plus the name of a tool, for example, 
Um, as I can see, uh, Faranak has asked in the in the chat what MFL stands for. So it stands for Modern Foreign Languages. So languages such as uh, French, German, Spanish uh, are the sort of the big three that are normally taught in uh, UK schools. OK, so in this particular example, we have a, uh, a, a resource which has been made available by Celeste Robillard, who's MFLCE on Twitter. And uh, I think I'm right in saying when she produced this, she was um, a teacher in her first year of teaching. And it's based on the book by Kate Jones, um, who is a uh, history teacher, uh, I think currently based in Abu Dhabi, although I believe she's coming back to the UK soon. And if you don't know Kate, she's absolutely um, prolific um, in uh, on Twitter, in webinars. She does her own Saturday morning radio show, as you do. Um, she's amazing. And she's written a number of different books around retrieval practice, of which this is the first. And I'm not being sponsored to say that. Um, I just know that she's one of the key figures uh, to look at um, in relation to retrieval practice. So you've got the link there to the book and you've also got the, um, the TS resource. So if you're looking for practical ideas around retrieval practice, that's a really good starting point. Uh, another good place to have a look is uh, this uh, Twitter chat, which is uh, through the uh, UK Ed Chat um, uh, hashtag. So I'd really encourage you, for example, if you're not into hashtags, to check out hashtags such as MFL Twitterati, such as IATEFL, such as Lang Chat in the States. And this one, UK Ed Chat, is, as it suggests, um, a cross-curricular chat with anybody interested in talking about education. So this particular one, which happened recently, uh, this was hosted by Kate Jones, um, whose former uh, Twitter handle was 87history. It's now Kate Jones underscore teach, if I remember correctly. And um, as you can see in that chat, lots of people from across the curriculum uh, were talking about how retrieval practice could be helpful in their own subject area. And what I've done to make it easier for everybody is I put the links to the, um, the different uh, Twitter chats there on the bottom left of the screen. So you can then have a look at that in your own time. Don't forget, I'm sharing the whole presentation with you. So you'll be able to watch it back uh, as many times as you need to. Um, Kirsty Dixon, who is um, a senior uh, leader in a school in, um, in uh, Yorkshire, she has written a blog around retrieval practice, which is mentioning people like Professor Rob Coe, who is um, a very highly regarded um, educator who's very interested in uh, an evidence-based approach to, um, to teaching. So if you look at that uh, blog post, I've given you the link there, you'll be able to see all the different references that um, Kirsty has made. And recently, uh, literally a few days ago, Kirsty spoke at the Nottingham uh, Research Ed um, event, which she did virtually, apparently not face-to-face, -face, as we have to do um, in, these, um, in these interesting times. Um, and she's, again, very well thought of, and uh, she's on Twitter as well. So uh, she's Dixon MFL on Twitter. So do have a look at that article. And then likewise, this is a, a head teacher, James Maxwell, who teaches in uh, Northern Ireland. And um, he's also a, a languages teacher as well. And I, my understanding is he invited Kate uh, Jones to come along to the school. And uh, the, uh, the school actually appears in a case study in her second book around retrieval practice. And again, um, James is quoting different people who are very well known in the UK, people like uh, David Didow and um, uh, Daniel Willingham and their different uh, approaches to uh, an evidence-based uh, uh, research um, perspective on teaching and learning, which is very, very popular in the, uh, in the UK at the moment. So again, you've got some links there to have a look at. Another piece of theory which I wanted to touch upon in relation to retrieval practice um, is uh, Herbing, uh, Ebbinghaus's forgetting curve. This is something which I think language teachers have, have known about uh, for many, many years. The idea that if the students uh, try to revise everything at the last minute, they'll not be able to retain um, the, uh, the content as well as if they space out the learning and they learn a little bit every uh, day. They review what they've been doing and as a result of that they then should do better in their in their final uh, test or exam and that's what this learning curve is all about um uh, i wouldn't say there would be 100 percent retention but i would uh, it's suggesting from the research that um you'll do better if you space out your learning you and you uh review the content that you're trying to learn over time uh, rather than trying to cram it all at the last minute uh, another little interesting fact about Ebbinghaus is apparently he coined the phrase learning curve, which is um, 
a very popular phrase nowadays, has been for a, a, a long uh, amount of time. And apparently he was the person that came up with the term learning curve, which I thought was really interesting as well. OK, this is um, a blog post from a friend of mine, Jose Picardo, who is a deputy head teacher in a school in Hampshire, just talking about the importance of low stakes testing. So using um, uh, tools such as Duolingo, Memrise, Kahoot, uh, Quizlet, and, uh, and one that you may not have heard of called Flashcards for Cram. There are obviously other ones um, which I'm going to be talking about a bit more in a moment, but essentially what um, Josie is suggesting is that if, if you do regular um, low stakes testing, that it will, uh, based on the uh, Ebbinghaus um, forgetting curve, it will it will pay dividends in the long in the long run. So instead of having everything based on a high stakes test, having regular low stakes testing will will really help with uh, with the uh, uh, remembering of the content the students are trying to do. So now what we're going to do is we're going to have a look at a number of different practical tools uh, in order to promote retrieval practice um, in the languages classroom with examples from languages teachers. So as you can see here, uh, I'm talking about the tool Mentimeter. It would be good to know in the chat um, whether people know about Mentimeter or if it's new to you. Mentimeter is a free tool um, which allows you to create presentations in which there is interactive dynamic content. There's a range of different activity types that you can choose from, most of which are, are free. Uh, you can only make two slides per presentation uh, with a free version, but you can make unlimited uh, numbers of presentations. So for example, top left, you've got uh, Jude uh, AP there who's using uh, the what's called the speech bubbles open ended option, whereby each student can write a little um, sentence or a couple of sentences uh, into their little box and it all appears live on the screen. So you, as the teacher, you create the presentation, it gives you a code, you share the uh, presentation with everyone. So let's say you're mirroring it via uh, a projector. You could do it face to face or you could do it um, uh, in a remote or a hybrid context. Uh, yes, just to clarify, MFL is modern foreign languages, that's all right. Um, and uh, it works really, really nicely. It's designed to be anonymous, so it's designed to promote student voice and to uh, get lots of different opinions. So it's really, it's democratic in the way that it, it's a good way of capturing the zeitgeist or testing the temperature of the room or how people are feeling about something. Uh, and it's a good way of maybe um, identifying common mistakes or what's the most popular answer. So uh, in the case of the example top left, the structure is the imperfect plus the conditional um, uh, tense. So uh, if I owned Microsoft, I would be rich. If I was good at French, I would be happy, for example. And then on the right hand side, uh, Karen Morgan, who uh, works in Spain, she also is using the same exercise type. So she, she's looking at the uh, structure. My back hurts because and then the students are giving different uh, reasons. Bottom left, you've got a different exercise type. This is Andres, who is a Spanish teacher from Malaysia, and he's used the picture option with the multiple choice uh, question type, whereby he's identified nine different types of dog. And the idea is that the students are supposed to say which dog best represents how they're feeling, which I think is a, a lovely idea. So as you can see, they've gone for different options, and um, I think that's very effective. And then bottom right, uh, that's a word cloud, which I uh, put together. In a, in a conference live back in 2018. I think there were about 250 people in the conference. Um, that was a face-to-face -face event. And so I asked the question, how can you assess how your school can effectively integrate apps and online resources to pro promote pupil engagement and develop out of school learning? And as you can see, everyone's then posted their answers onto the, uh, onto the word cloud. And the larger the word, the more um, people have, have posted that. So you can see that Quizlet and Memorize back in 2018 were the uh, most popular choices. So that's really interesting as well. So very good for retrieval practice. You could ask the question, uh, post everything you can remember about what we did the day before or the week before or the month before, what have you. And then you can identify which are the most popular words. And that could be that they're overusing that word. For example, if you ask about, let's say, adjectives and it, uh, there's only uh, one particular adjective which is used more than others, then that could identify that they need to have a wider range. Um, so really good for retrieval practice as a starter or as, a, uh, uh, as an exit ticket, maybe as a plenary. Uh, this is also really useful, I think. Um, the, uh, this is a, um, a, a link to how you can remove inappropriate words. There is a profanity filter that comes with Mentimeter. But if, um, 
uh, if one gets through, so you have to enable the profundity filter, but once you've enabled it, it will work with all your different uh, presentations. Um, but if one gets through, what you do is you hover bottom left of the screen where the floating toolbar appears, you click on the close voting option, and then you can then hover over a particular word or short phrase. Um, when you hover over it, a line will go through it, and then you can then click on it, and it, it will then remove it from the, from the word cloud. That also works with open-ended questions as well. So I think that's really, really uh, useful from the point of view of, um, of managing your class. The fact that it's supposed to be anonymous, it's designed to be anonymous. So if someone writes something inappropriate, you can always delete it um, in that way. So here are such a, some of the popular quizzing tools. I can see in the, the chat, we've got the question, could you recommend us the best tools of quizzes and assessments? So that's absolutely, this slide is perfect for you, Beatrix. Um, there are lots of things out there, but the idea of this presentation is to um, is to give you, let's say, a shortcut. And so if you're interested in, in some of the tools, you can obviously go onto YouTube and, and find a tutorial and you'll learn how, how to use them. So the idea of this presentation is to give you a flavor of all the things that are out there. So I would say, based on feedback from the MFL Twitterati plus other um, language associations around the world, I would say these are some of the most popular and it may be that you don't know all of these which will be great so i can teach you about some ones that you can then check out in your own time quizlet quizzes kahoot look it learning apps word wall and gimkit so quizlet live i know that quizlet live um, proved particularly popular at the beginning of the pandemic um, the way in which it can be used in two modes either as a group whole class mode or it can be used um, uh, as what's called an independent mode where you need at least two people but you don't need to have a whole class so uh, here are some some tweets, some examples from different um, schools uh, using Quizlet Live. If you haven't seen Quizlet Live before, essentially the idea is that you can use a um, a set from your Quizlet account, or you can search for a set on Quizlet, and you can um, uh, launch the Quizlet Live option. That will then divide your uh, class into different groups, um, normally named um, with different animal names. Uh, in each group of say three or four people. One, only one person will have the answer. So the idea is that the students then have to work out in their group who's got the right answer and, um, and get them to answer, as it were. If you make a mistake, then you go back to the beginning. So you have this sort of um, uh, sliding scale on the right-hand side there, top, but sorry, top left there, and the winner winning group is the group that hits the right-hand side first. So if you make a mistake, you'll go back to the beginning. Now, this can be done in a face-to-face -face classroom, but it can also... Uh, be used in a uh, in a remote or a hybrid teaching uh, uh, context. So here, for example, you've got Rainford High and Shubrunus um, um, uh, School as well, uh, both of which are state schools in uh, the UK. And as you can see, they they're doing a Quizlet live at a certain time. They'll share the code with the uh, with the class uh, via uh, Show My Homework or Google Classroom or Microsoft Teams, and um, that's how everyone gets involved. So a great uh, group activity. I'm sure we all know Russell Stannard, but if you uh, don't know Russell, then uh, he's obviously um, amazing. He has his own teacher training videos website and he's prolific on YouTube. And I just pulled together some of the tutorials that he's done on Quizlet, but he's done lots and lots of different tutorials on lots of the tools I'm talking about here. So do check out uh, his YouTube channel uh, or his, uh, his website. But if you're looking at different ideas on using Quizlet, have a look at some of these videos to start off with. Right, quizzes. I can see in the chat, uh, lots of you are sharing your favorite uh, uh, tools, which is fantastic. So here again, quizzes is a similar tool to Todd Kahoot. Um, I know uh, Kate Jones is a big fan of quizzes. She says it's her favorite tool for retrieval practice. And um, you can see you've got a number of different exercise types on the left-hand side there. You've got multiple choice, checkbox, fill in the blank, uh, poll, and open-ended. Uh, here are some screenshots from um, language departments or individuals who are talking about the value of using quizzes in class. So you can see, for example, uh, Forest MFL is saying a great way to use quizzes to finish off a lesson. So finish off the, the lesson with a bang, as it were. Uh, Karine Longman also, uh, who's a, a teacher at the International School of Monaco, um, and she is also using it to end a live lesson, practicing some grammar. Uh, Kings Ely, where uh, Esmeralda Salgado is uh, head of department, she is using uh, quizzes there for self-assessment. So again, going back to that sort of um, low stakes testing. Uh, Katie Lockett, who is now based in the southwest of England, she was in Beijing at the time of this tweet in 2018. And I'll just read this to you if it's okay. So she, as you can see, um, she's saying, quote from a student after using quizzes for the first time, 
I'm loving it. And on seeing the data at the end, oh, that's cool. You could send that to our parents. So I think that's a fantastic message there. Um, the fact that the student wanted um, all the results, uh, you get an Excel spreadsheet with, with all the different results that you get from quizzes. And that's similar to other tools such as uh, Kahoot and, and Socrative and so on and so forth. Uh, that's great. And then Andres, again, who I mentioned in Mentimeter, uh, he's using the uh, the option of creating your own customized memes uh, within uh, quizzes. So he's using Bitmojis to say things like you can do it or congratulations, but in Spanish. And you can do that very, very easily to change the language of your Bitmoji. All you have to do is install the Bitmoji Chrome extension. You have to install the app first to create an account. Then you can install the Chrome extension. Then you click on the three dots top right in Chrome. You go to settings, advanced settings, um, language. You then click on add language, add the language that you want the Bitmojis to appear in. Then click on the three dots to the right of that language and click move to top. Once you click move to top, when you open up the Bitmoji Chrome extension, then all the Bitmojis which include text will be in that language, which is fantastic. I can see someone's mentioning toytheater.com as well. That's also a good website. There's so many out there, aren't there? Uh, this is also a really nice option. It used to be free, but unfortunately, um, well, unfortunately for us, but not for, for the company, they decided to make it a premium feature or a super uh, feature, as they call it. This is being able to add questions in quizzes. So uh, you can record some audio as an MP3, um, either in, on the tool or using a tool like Audacity, etc. upload it onto uh, quizzes and then make asynchronous listen comprehension activities, which is really, really nice. Um, this is an example, a screenshot of when I did a British Council event uh, for uh, British Council in Indonesia. And I think we had about 700 people in the room all taking part live with a list of comprehension about different capitals and it worked really, really nicely. So I would encourage you to have a look at that, but unfortunately it's not free. Um, lots of the tools I mentioned already, like um, GimKit and Kahoot and Quizzes, uh, as a result of the pandemic have introduced uh, different uh, asynchronous ways of accessing the, the content through homework assignments. So for example, quizzes can be done as a live quiz, so in a synchronous context, but it can also be used uh, to assign homework. So if you do go for the assign homework option, you can choose a deadline and you can use uh, you can choose lots of different ways of customizing your quiz. So you could say, give the students a week to do the quiz and therefore they can then um, uh, do that whenever they, whenever they have access to um, uh, an internet connection or their mobile phone and you can then monitor their results um, as a result of that during the week. So I think that's really, really nice. I also like the teleport feature in quizzes, which allows you to find um, a question related to your topic and teleport it from uh, uh, someone else's um, uh, quiz into your quiz, which is a great time saver as well. Gimkit, so I mentioned Gimkit a couple of times. Gimkit, similar to Kahoot, but um, has this um, sort of token economy approach in the way that you can gain um, virtual dollars. Um, the, the more risk that you take, you can, you can um, uh, earn lots of dollars. And so the, there's a real motivation for the students to be able to get more dollars than their, than their peers and their friends. So again, based on multiple choice, but it has that other factor. Uh, one of my highlights of, of this year was I, I took part in the Sculpt Conference, which is um, a, 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 um, an American conference, statewide uh, conference. And we actually had Josh Gimkit, so Josh from Gimkit, who took part, who I think is about 18 years old now. But when he started the company, I think he was about 14 years old. Um, again, with, with Gimkit, uh, not everything is free. You get five sets, I think, for free. But then if you want to use more than that, then you have to pay. Um, but of course, the developers have to, make a, have to make a living. So anyway, the reason I put this screenshot in was just to say that it was very much, uh, it was a lot of fun to take part in this sort of the social um, part of the conference by by taking part with Josh in Gimkit. And uh, Josh introduced us to this drawing option, a new drawing option, which is called Draw That um, in Gimkit. And so as you can see, one person draws the picture and then the other students then have to guess what it is. So what a great way, a great multimodal way, I think, of um, practicing languages. And I think that, for example, this could be very useful for, for vocabulary, for grammar, and so on and so forth. Gimkit also gets the option, has the option of being able to set homework assignments, and you've got the link there to see um, how that works. Okay. Another um, tool which you may not be, be aware of is called shalala.com, which is also to do with drawing. Uh, this was developed by Chris Hammer, who's a Spanish teacher from the, uh, the States, 
And um, in addition to um, other webinars I've been doing, I've been doing my own sort of promotional webinars whereby, whereby I will uh, connect with a company, they will do a webinar um, where I'm hosting, they're then presenting about the, um, about the, uh, the particular tool and uh, everyone can come for free, but it's, it's, a, it's a commercial product. Um, that said, with Shalala, um, you do have um, some free content that you can access, um, but you're limited to the number of assignments, et cetera, that you can do. But the, what the key uh, feature of Shalala is, it's all about drawing. So conveying meaning through drawing. So a bit like whiteboard.fi, which I saw someone mentioned in the chat, you can ask a question and then the, the, uh, the students can then all draw their uh, their answers. They can also create a story collaboratively as well through pictures. Really, really nice. So do check it out. And you can watch the, the video there, which is an hour or so long. Uh, and if you go to my YouTube channel, uh, which is Joe Dale 100, you'll be able to see all the promotional webinars that I've done, in addition to the um, 130 plus webinars that I've organized with the Association for Language Learning, which is the equivalent of, of IATEFL, I would say, in England and Wales, but for modern foreign language teachers. And since the start of the pandemic, along with my friend Helen Myers, who's the chair of the London branch of um, AWL, we have organized over 130 <laughs> webinars with speakers from literally all over the world. And they're all available for free from my YouTube channel, as well as on the AWL London website. If you go to that and click on the webinars option, you can see all the archive there. Um, so there we are. I'm giving you some homework here. Fantastic. So some other ideas around speaking. As I said, I talked about multimodal feedback. Vocaroo is really good for being able to record um, audio. I'm sure a lot of you know it, but it works on all devices. The, the students don't need to have an account. Um, they can record for as long as they want to. And the audio is kept on the servers for up to one year. You can download the, the audio. You can share the link of the audio. Um, so it could be used, for example, uh, for audio feedback in a Microsoft Teams session, or it could be used for speaking homework, whereby you record the audio and you send it to the to the, uh, the the teacher as a student. You could also create a Google form or a Microsoft form as a teacher, um, give it to the students with a short answer box. They then copy and paste the Vocaroo link into that box, and you generate a Microsoft Excel spreadsheet or a Google Sheet with all the links all in the one uh, place with the names of the students next to it. So if you haven't heard of Vocaroo, I would say it's the number one web tool for recording audio. Um, one that you may not have heard of, this is um, uh, being produced in Japan. It's called Record MP3 Online. It works in a slightly different way because you do need to have an account as a teacher to set it up, but the students don't need an account. What you do is you create your account, you then click on the audio folder on the left-hand side and you can record your audio. When you record your audio, you have to put, well, you don't have to put in, but it's advised that you put in um, an ID and your name, which um, it could be say your initials or whatever you want to use. You record your audio up to five minutes of audio, and then that then goes into your audio folder. You then get a link, you provide the link to the students. They can then all uh, record their audio and will all go into um, the same folder, which is private. And you can always reset that link, which means that they can no longer add any other content uh, into, the, uh, into the, the audio folder. So the students don't need to have an account, just the teacher does. And it's a very, very nice uh, tool, I think. Right. Another idea is to create digital praise postcards using uh, Quicker, which is another fantastic tool, particularly for asynchronous um, conversation practice using what's called Quicker Conversations. On my YouTube channel, I've done many uh, webinars where I've, I've talked about this, so you can check that out. But um, this is an example of um, how you can record some audio, attach it to a QR code, and then share it with um, the, uh, the, the students. So praising a student's work. So in this example, you can click on the link um, here. Let me just very quickly demonstrate how this works. Uh, I'm going to record some audio. I'm just going to get rid of the... QR code there, like that. So I'm going to record some audio using Vokaroo and show you how it works. So this template was developed by uh, an assistant ed teacher called Mr. El Pichi, and uh, I borrowed his uh, his template and uh, and made this praise postcard. Here we go. So I've been having a look at your work, Joe. I think it's a fantastic ex example of uh, written work, particularly to do with the topic that we're looking at at the moment. So well done. Keep up the good work. OK, I'm now going to click Save and Share. I'm going to click the QR code option to download this, save QR code, 
click save, it downloads the QR code. I go back to my praise postcard and I have then only got to drag and drop that over the top of the of the little square then. I can obviously, I can delete the, the square behind to make it look nice and neat. Um, I then put the name of the student here and I click file, download, and I can download this as a PDF or a PNG, for example, and then share it with the students via the LMS that I'm using, which could be Google Classroom or Microsoft Teams, et cetera. So that's how that works. And um, if you click on the links there that end with copy, you can make a copy of what I've just shown you and put it into your own Google Drive and then, and then use it however you see fit. So that's how that works. Uh, Moat, I don't know how many people have heard of Moat, but Moat is a brilliant new um, extension, Chrome extension that works in um, Google Docs, Google Slides and Classroom but it also can be used in other places because of the fact now that you have what's called Moatpad, which means you can record within the Chrome extension and you can also um, uh, have an iOS app as well. So you can record with the same, in this, using the same account, you can record and you can post the audio wherever you want. So once you've installed the Chrome extension, whenever you get a comment box in Docs, Slides and Classroom, the little uh, purple circle will appear with the M in it. You click on that and you can record up to 30 seconds for free um for your audio feedback that's why i talked about multimodal feedback if you want to record for longer than that uh you have to pay i think it's like 20 pounds for the year to have up to 90 seconds per recording um if you want to have the multilingual transcription then it's about 50 pounds for the year and you can you can um transcribe it into a number of different languages uh it's really really nice really really fantastic um, another option is called moat to slides this is a video clip describing how you do this but essentially uh, in uh, Google Slides, you get a little moat icon again in the actual uh, slides interface. You click on that, you can record your audio, and you then insert the audio straight into the Google Slides. Um, here's um, an anim animated GIF from Jake Miller from the States showing you how you do this. You click on the moat option there. You record your audio up to 30 seconds for free. This is using the premium account using a minute and a half. So for free, you can record as many as you want for 30 seconds. You can then listen back to it. You then click on the insert option. Uh, you'll then see it says creating audio. The audio player then appears. You can choose to click it, um, autom uh, click it um, to play it, or it can play automatically. Uh, you can also right click the, um, the audio player as well. And I'll just uh, go on to the next slide. You can also right click the audio player as well. And it will say replace image. So you can replace an image uh, with the loud, uh, replace the loudspeaker with an image and therefore, when you click on that image, it will play the audio as well, which is brilliant. Back in August of 2021, uh, so a couple of months ago, there was a Motocon event, which was two three-hour sessions with teachers from around the world showing innovative ways in which they'd used uh, uh, Moat. But I think that for languages, there is one specifically about languages, Springboard Language Learning with Moat. But all of these ideas, I would say more or less, like uh, audio bingo with Moat would be useful in the languages classroom. So I'd encourage you to have a look at that as well. WordWall. I know Russell Stanard's a big fan of WordWall. Uh, very easy to use. It's been mentioned in the chat as well. Uh, you get access to many different activity types uh, and very useful for creating very you know, easily interactive um, uh, exercises for the students to do. Here's some tutorials, including one from Russell there. Uh, you've got the links bottom left um, for checking these out on YouTube. Here's an example. Uh, made by a language teacher in Ireland. So you can see if you haven't seen WordWall before, you get, you've got things like gap fills and uh, reordering. You've got a game there, bottom left, which is called Whack-A-Mole, which you can imagine would be very, uh, uh, a lot of fun. You've got a uh, 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 matching activity and so on and so forth, reordering, uh, et cetera. Uh, with WordWall, some of the templates support assignments. In other words, they can be done uh, asynchronously. Uh, in addition to ones that can be done synchronously. So not all the ones can be done asynchronously, but these ones can, just an airplane, anagram, balloon pop, and so on and so forth. That's literally a screenshot from a YouTube clip. Um, so there we are, that's that one. Here's some information about WordWall. Um, so essentially with the free version, you get 18 types of games of which you can choose five. Once you've chosen those five, you can make as many as you want um with those five templates and you can also go into the community section and uh, bookmark other people's activities edit them and save them to your library um, you can also make principal activities as well uh, i know what some people do is they pay for like one month of uh, the premium uh, version which means you get access to 34 types of games 
uh, and then they just make make lots and lots of games during that month. They then stop their uh, subscription so they can then still use those games. They're not deleted once you stop the subscription and then you go from there. But um, I know Russell has said that um, Wordwall, uh, he's been told that that's one of his, uh, one of the, the favorite tools by language teachers at the moment, um, which is fantastic. There we are. Um, we haven't really got time for this exercise. So there's just a couple of exercises there. If you have a look at this one is a reordering one. And the next one is a um, is a true or false one, but you can do that in your own time. Uh, learning apps is another tool which is which is completely free, which is useful for uh, interactive exercises. Again, you've got things like um, annotation of an image, gap fills. You can uh, insert YouTube clips as well into the gap fills, which is really really nice. Uh, here, this is a uh, an overview uh, from a, a language teacher, Julia Morris, who's based in the southwest of England. And you can see you've got things like um, matching pairs, group assignments, number lines, simple order, et cetera. It's got a really nice text-to-speech engine as well. So you can do, again, asynchronous listening comprehension practice as well for, say, matching activities. Uh, and you can embed YouTube clips as well for listening comprehension, uh, which is just fantastic. Blookit. I don't know how many people have, have written about Blookit so far. This might be new to you. So Blookit is a similar type of multiple choice activity, similar to, say, Quizlet and Kahoot and so on and so forth. You can actually save a bit of time with creating your activities because you can import your Quizlet sets uh, into Blookit, which is a great time saver. So do check that out, uh, the instructions on the website. And it looks very sort of gamified as well. Uh, this is a, an Italian teacher, um, Simona Gravison from Scotland, who's using um, Blookit um, and promoting the use of retrieval practice with it. She's uh, basing some of the activities she's doing on a sentence builder. You can see an example of that bottom right. And uh, this is um, it gives you a flavor of the sorts of activities that you can do, such as Gold Quest, which I would say is the most popular um, based on what I've seen from what the MFL Twitterati have been tweeting about. The fact you can steal gold from other people to uh, improve your points. Uh, here are a few um, uh, features about Blookit. Um, it is free. You can pay $36 a year to create your own folders, but you don't need to do that. Uh, and you've got live and asynchronous modes as well. But it's essentially about promoting which you will practice through gamification. Carousel Learning is another tool which uh, you may not have heard of, which is to do with uh, multiple choice. But as opposed to just a standard multiple choice type of um, situation, you can actually, um, as a teacher, you can ask the students to improve their answers or to answer again. So again, this is based on um, uh, research. Um, it was created by um, Adam Boxer, as well as some other people, other educators in the UK. And um, uh, on this particular page, you've got a couple of uh, Loom screencasts by a head of a department called Jane Bassnett, uh, who works in a Microsoft Showcase School uh, in the south of England. And she's given the teacher view, the student view, and how to upload questions. And then you've also got Sarah Noble, who's a languages teacher from the UK, talking about how she uses carousel learning uh, in her classroom. So if you're looking for other ideas around retrieval practice, this is very nice. And it's all based on, on, uh, on uh, a research um, point of view. So have a look at the why it works uh, option there in carousel learning. Tilt webinars I've talked about already. So Tilt stands for technology language teaching. We, this is a show and tell one whereby Jane um, showcases how to use carousel learning. And we have a few other speakers there as well, including one about learning apps. Um, this is another one, part two, where again, we had some different tools showcased, such as Blookit by different language teachers. Uh, Glenn Cake, who's a Canadian uh, language teacher uh, who's been doing distance learning for many, many years. He did a tilt webinar for us around different quizzing tools, which you can have a look out there. Uh, Kerry Ann Wen James, who's uh, an assistant head teacher in, uh, in Cardiff in South Wales, also did a webinar for us around quizzing tools. Uh, nearly finished, then this is um, Kate Jones, again, who I mentioned at the beginning, is giving her sort of top tips on multiple choice questions, things like uh, three or four options are, are optimum. I really like the include I don't know yet to identify gaps. That's based on Carol Dweck's um, growth mindset, which is really nice as well. So a few, a few tips there as well you to have a look at and this is a blog post by Esmeralda Salgado I've mentioned already around retrieval practice and her views on that I would really recommend uh, Esmeralda's blog which is mflcraft.blogspot.com and Jane's uh, Jane Bassnett's blog is whatjanelearntnext.blogspot.com so I'd really encourage you to have a look at those two blogs 
And also there's um, Sylvia Basto. Basto is B-A-S-T-O-W. She's a head of department in the north of England. Uh, her blog is also fantastic. I would say those are the best three blogs around research ba uh, research based approach uh, in the UK at the moment, who are people who are language teachers. So just a thought as well. Um, if you've enjoyed this presentation, then uh, do consider inviting me to wherever you are in the world to do a webinar. Or obviously, if I'm allowed to travel, I can travel as well. But if you'd like to um, book me to do a webinar, here are 18 example sessions which I can put together for you as a bespoke session, whatever you would like. I could do an hour, two hours, a week, whatever you want. Uh, let me know, and I'd love to hear from you. And here's the presentation. So it's is.gd forward slash World Teachers Day. And again, I'd officially like to thank Paul for hosting and for uh, obviously the British Council for giving me this fabulous opportunity. I really hope you found it useful. And we've now got 14 minutes for questions. So uh, I really look forward to answering any of the questions and uh, we can go from there. Shall I stop showing my screen, Paul? What do you think? Yeah, you can do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, maybe be nice. Cool. Can see you in, in, in glorious Here we go. screen mode. Lovely. Thank Thanks, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. That's great. Thanks, Joe. Um, I, I, yeah, I've been to a few of your talks, and they were sort of they were sort of leave me a bit breathless because there's there's so much. Which is, but, but that's great and um, I love it and I think a lot of people obviously from the comments in the chat also love that so it's um, it, it's it's brilliant thank you for that I think I mean I, I know we, we spoke um, before the webinar about doing sort of fewer tools but demonstrating them a bit more which you know might, might be something we can we can look at as a, as a follow-up but um, but for this and as a, an example of tools for retrieval practice I think that was um, that was that was great fantastic lots of tools there that I've, that I've not heard of because I'm not in the classroom anymore so it's sort of dropped off um one thing I know I know there are there are questions and please do put questions for Joe in into the Q&A um if you have them one that I wanted to ask about I know um it's probably going back about 10 years or so ago now where that where lots of tools seem to emerge um a fairly sort of set at the same time at quite a quick pace and there was a lot there and a lot of people were kind of going yeah this one this one this one this one um and then obviously i think people sort of started to slow down and the pedagogy kind of came in and the discussion about you know the, the value of that from a pedagogical point of view um obviously with the list of, of the tools there people are going to go away they're going to look at your presentation and they're going to look at those tools what can they do as, as sort of teachers to to reflect on the benefit and the use of those from, from a pedagogical point of view do you think well, I think I think that's a great point about the fact that it's very easy to get overwhelmed by the number of tools out there. And the point of this presentation is to try and uh, give everybody a shortcut to um, what is available. So all the things I've mentioned are being used, uh, are tried and tested by teachers from literally all over the world. Uh, and in some cases for many, many years. Um, and I've, it's very clear in the chat, there are some people who know a lot of these tools already, but it might be there are some people who haven't heard of these tools at all. So whenever we're talking about technology, um, then it's very important, I think, to give a range of, uh, of different ideas. So there'll be, there should be hopefully something for everybody uh, here. But of course, the first and foremost, uh, uh, what's really important is that we focus on the pedagogy and it can be very easy to be seduced by you know the shiny shiny of uh, a new tool uh, etc but as a result of the pandemic uh, it's meant that teachers who maybe have been reluctant before to use technology have had to use the technology and therefore that discussion which maybe was um, uh, was had in a smaller community that community is now is much wider because of the necessity of using the technology to to cope with uh, remote or hybrid hybrid teaching so um my advice would be if you're aware of a lot of these tools already, have a look at the presentation, um, check out things which maybe you haven't heard of, uh, have a play, uh, share the um, ideas and your experiences with colleagues in your school or in your local area, uh, have that sort of cascade approach. If you're new to a lot of these ideas, then I would suggest choose one thing that you've seen in the last uh, 45 minutes that's jumped at you, for example, Moat. You think, oh, that looks really interesting. I will check that out. And I'd also encourage you to, uh, in addition to my uh, YouTube channel, which has hours and hours and hours and hours of free professional development, um, also ask on Twitter using the uh, the hashtag MFL Twitterati plus the name of the tool. Um, and also go onto YouTube and do a search for, for example, Word Wall Tutorial. 
uh, or go to Russell Stanard's website as well, which is excellent. So what I've tried to do is provide a whole range of different um, ideas, uh, practical suggestions from, from practicing language teachers and sort of tutorials. So I appreciate there's been a lot of information, but we are recording it so you can watch it back with the pause button and you're going to have the presentation as well. Um, I'd love to come home with you as well, but unfortunately I can't do that. But um, I'm, I'm trying to make it as, uh, as accessible as possible for everybody. But, but find your own way and don't try everything at once if you're, uh, if you're more of a newbie to these sorts of tools. I think you're going to uh, 520 people's houses in Zoom, plus about <laughs> 200 on Facebook might be, might be a challenge. Um, <laughs> Okay, thanks. I guess, I mean, it's, it, it was interesting, I, I don't know if you saw but, um, Sophia's talk yesterday around um, remote teaching and she sort of made the distinction between emergency remote teaching and, and online teaching and obviously what everyone, as you were sort of saying, you know, the, all of these tools were kind of used maybe by, by fewer people initially and now everyone's kind of teaching online. So obviously I think the idea of moving from emergency remote teaching to, to sort of slightly more pedagogically sound versions of online teaching, these, these tools will sort of follow and some will drop off and some will kind of continue with teachers and, and be used in, in different ways and, and shared. Um, yeah, so absolutely. But I, I also think that being part of a social media community such as the MFL Twitter RT allows you to have those sorts of daily discussions on what's the best tool for doing this what's the best tool for that pedagogically speaking I'm trying to do this and then having people like myself and other people suggesting um, different uh, ways of doing that um, based on if they work in a Google environment or Microsoft environment or or, or a more general environment um, the, the, having that sort of professional pedagogical conversation I think to me uh, using Twitter and Facebook groups is an amazing way of being able to do that so that you you make sure that you're always focusing on the pedagogy and not just on the on the tool as it were mm -hmm. but I, I agree completely with Sophia who's also uh, awesome if you haven't seen her before uh, she she did a tilt webinar for us around hybrid teaching actually uh, in the middle of last year which was awesome um, but um, it was absolutely emergency remote teaching to start mm -hmm. off with but I, I, as with everything once you've been doing it for a while then you can have a more of a reflective mode uh, around it and um, and work out, you know, the the cream of the crop, as it were, on, on, on say, tools that you know definitely work. And again, the idea yeah. of this presentation is to do that. Uh, I can remember at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, there were lots of teachers who wanted to essentially um, replicate what they were doing face to face, but um, mm -hmm. digitally. So I know that I know it's been mentioned in the chat, but whiteboard.fi is another tool which allows you to essentially mimic uh, mini whiteboards. So for language teachers, for things like um, sentence structure or for uh, drawing or for grammar practice, that was a no brainer being able to use uh, that tool uh, in a remote context whereby you're sharing your screen, each student gets access to their own board. They can then draw on that, they can write text on it, they can add an image. As a teacher, you can create an image and push it to everyone's whiteboard. So you can create like a template, those sorts of things. And then, the challenge around speaking uh, and asynchronous speaking practices as well. So I've mentioned things like Flipgrid, not in today's session, but things like Flipgrid and Vokaroo, which I mentioned today, uh, and so on and so forth. So I think there was a, a huge amount of anxiety at the beginning of the pandemic, but hopefully now that people have sort of found their feet more, uh, having um, used the technology uh, possibly for the first time to, to teach remotely or in a hybrid context, then hopefully everyone's feeling a bit more relaxed and is more focused on the pedagogy, of course, which is what it's yeah. all about. Yeah. Okay. Great. It's a bit like, I always sort of think of it as a sort of a very fast flowing river at the beginning, which sort of gradually sort <laughs> yeah. of slows down as you get closer to the, I don't know, to the yeah. lake or to the sea or whatever, but anyway. Um, so uh, yes, questions. So just before we dig on to questions, I'd just like to flag out a comment. Valentina um, Rudichuk who says, I express your big gratitude for the useful information. I watched it via phone on a bus and outside before my next lesson, everything for self-development. So I think that sort of sums up um, some of the, <laughs> the love it. and the dedication. <laughs> I know, yeah. um, okay, question from Alfred. Alfred Salas uh, says, common knowledge that working memory is closely linked to attitude and age. The question is how can um, EFL teachers cope with adult learners whose working memory seems to slow down their own learning process. Um, this is something that's been observed in contexts where language learners have to cover a wide range of content within a specific time frame. So it's quite a big question there. It is quite a big um, question. I mean, uh, I suppose the obvious thing to say is just uh, encourage them to practice as much as they possibly can um, through uh, 
learners who, who do get older that yeah I, I absolutely agree with, with with the the fact that their working memory uh, could reduce over time but I would all I would just say is uh, practice as much as possible whenever you get a, um, a moment to yourself a bit of um, dead time as it were practice on your phone as, as you said you know the, the the teacher that joined us via their phone practice on your phone when you're going for a walk or when you're doing something else uh, practice on these sorts of um, uh, tools um, lots of which if not all have uh, independent modes so you can um, uh, do that sort of uh, self-quizzing uh, to help you to remember and I, unfortunately I think that may be just be the reality as we all get a bit older maybe we forget um, things that we try to remember but through practice it should help keep those grains uh, gray cells going for mm. a bit longer hopefully <laughs> yeah yeah well exactly yeah I think yeah as you say kind of the more you use them the sort of the less likely it exactly. is that your, your memory will um Okay, question, a couple of questions actually from Mustafa. Um, I think you kind of talked about this, but most of these most of these quizzes you can adapt for different levels, no student? Absolutely, for, yeah. Uh, language levels, yeah, okay. Absolutely. Um, and, and they're not specifically for English language, or some of them obviously for specific, specifically for English language learning, but they can be used, or most of them can be used across different school yeah. subjects, would you say? Yeah. Yeah, okay. abs absolutely. But what I've tried to point out is, for example, with, say, quizzes, when you get the option to add audio, that's fantastic uh, for listening comprehension practice or with uh, learning apps, the way you can embed a YouTube clip. So that's wonderful mm -hmm. for, again, listening comprehension. So I've tried to mention a multimodal approach so that it's not mm -hmm. just all reading and writing. But yeah, it could be all these tools can be used in different contexts. But I've obviously tried to provide examples of language teachers using these tools as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. Um, okay, Oops, related to retrieval practice, but um, someone's asked about pronunciation apps. If you've got any recommendations for for helping with pronunciation. Um, so I think for pronunciation, I would recommend, um, for example, maybe screencasting. So the fact you can record your screen while you're maybe um, you could be annotating on the screen while recording your your voice, annotate uh, so um, uh, describing what you're you're writing. Um, uh, essentially with pronunciation you want to have the model and then you want to then have you have a go at um, uh, replicating that model so again moat could be very useful so you could ask the students to um, listen to your moat recordings in say a table they could then record their answers and they would appear alongside um, to access the recordings if the students don't don't have the moat extension then they could click on the, the link to listen to it and then could send you an audio recording such as a Vokaroo or put that into a table, um, that sort of idea. Or if they have the extension installed, they can then record uh, directly within the Google Doc um, and post it straight in as well. So moat uh, and screencasting, I think, could be useful for pra practicing pronunciation. But again, I would suggest doing a search for MFL Twitter RT plus pronunciation and in 10 minutes, probably you would find some really good examples that you'd find inspiring and think, oh, yeah, I could just change that slightly from my own context and, and do that. So that's what I normally do for presentations. I normally put in MFL Twitter RT plus the name of a tool or in this case, retrieval practice and then uh, get inspired by what other language teachers have been tweeting about. And everything is archived because the, the uh, as I said, we started in about 2008. It's all archived. So you can have some a tweet that was tweeted years ago that is still absolutely relevant for what you're trying to do uh, for the next lesson, as it were, you know what I mean? You know, so it's, it's very good from that point of view. Okay. I'm just looking, if there's anything on Facebook, I sort of forget that there are lots of people watching on Facebook, but about 100 or so people watching, um, mostly comments um, saying thank you. Uh, I'd also like to say thank you to, um, to Marcus and Karen, who are doing a fantastic job of, of moderating the, um, the chat that's happening in Facebook as well. So thank you um, to both of you, Karen and Marcus, and to our Facebook audience as well for engaging. Um, maybe time for one more question. Um, good. Okay, how might me as teachers share ideas about what we need and want from tools like these and feed new ideas requirement into app developers and designers plans, sort of a, a pedagogical driven wish list, and that's from Josh. That's a great question. So I would say that um, Twitter is brilliant for that, um, as well as Facebook groups. So I would say um, find a good Facebook group or a, a hashtag to follow that's part of a community such as MFL Twitterati. Ask lots of questions, join the conversation, as one says. And in relation to 
developers. Um, I find that in incredible for uh, getting in contact with developers via Twitter, asking questions. They're normally really, really keen, in my experience, to get, to get back to you straight away. If something isn't working right, or you got an error message, or you're saying, why isn't this working um, properly, for example, that's uh, that's a great way um, to do that. And the best developers are the ones that, that will respond straight away and will act on their on their users' feedback, and and that's how everything how everything develops. To 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 um to use a pun, I think um uh yeah, that's a great question, and particularly in the twenty first century, even though we've been in the twenty first century for twenty one years now, it's exactly the way to go. So ask a question. If you don't ask, you you, you know you won't uh, you won't know the answer. And um, or as they say in the north of England, shy bands uh, get nout. That's why that's a good one. Um, ask ask the developers connect with uh, like-minded teachers and um, nothing is holding you back apart from time, <laughs> I would say. Thanks. Thanks, Joe. Um, sort of pretty much run out of time just to sort of cover a couple of questions um, and just to go say what I said at the beginning of the webinar in case you missed it. In terms of certificates and recordings and slides, you have the QR code um, and the link to the slides, but I will um, put that link on the page on Teaching English where the recording is so you can access it that way. Certificates, um, I've been putting links in um, to the chat, although I appreciate that if you're watching on a mobile phone, you might not be able to click those links. Don't worry. Um, you will get an email tomorrow, 24 hours after this event finishes, and in the email it will say thank you very much for attending and it will give you the link to the certificate as well as instructions on how to download it and add your name. Um, there will also be the link to the feedback survey. Please do um, fill that in. It should open up if you're watching on a laptop or a desktop computer, that link should open up automatically when the webinar finishes so you can give your feedback, um, which we would love to get. I'm sure Joe would love to hear as well. Um, I'm just going to quickly share my screen before we go, just to say this is what's coming up um, later today. So at five o'clock UK time, we've got Matt Elman, um, who's going to be talking about a recipe for teacher learning. And that's all around professional development and what makes professional development effective um, from a teacher's perspective and also from a teacher trainer's perspective. So if you haven't registered for that, you still can. Um, we have places available. Um, please do uh, go to the Teaching English website to register for that um, and that is what is coming up and then later this week uh, tomorrow we've got Joe Gore who's going to be talking about teenagers um, flow and the random factor uh, and we've also have got Jessica McKay later on talking about WhatsApp for interactivity interactive tasks and then on Friday Nikki Hockley will be talking about digital literacies and the kind of upgrade on their recent book um, digital literacies and then to finish us off for the week, we've got Kerry Jones finishes off. That sounded wrong, didn't it? To finish off for the week, uh, Kerry Jones and Kath Billsborough will be talking about eco-literacy and what that is, why it is and how we can use it. So lots and lots of stuff coming up um, this week. But for now, um, just to say thank you ever so much again to Joe. It's been great. Um, I can't believe we've waited this long to get you on to teach English for a webinar, given how long I've known you. But um, we have now and we're going to get you back as well, hopefully. So uh, that'd be brilliant. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming along. Thanks, everyone, on Facebook. Thanks, Marcus. Thanks, Karen. Um, and hopefully we'll see you all a bit later on today for our second webinar. Brilliant. Cheers, cool. Joe. Take care. Thanks, Paul. Bye. Bye, all.